everyone. How are you doing tonight? Good. So good to see you again. Um, I'm here a lot, which is, makes me very happy. Um, so I'm very honored to speak to Mira tonight. She is not only a role model for women in the business, but an extraordinarily talented person. So let me bring her to the stage. Mira, come join us, please. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. Very well. Uh, so we talked a little bit about um, everything that's been going on in the business the last few months. And obviously, we don't want to dwell on it, but your name has come up a lot as being someone who's joined the chorus, I'll say. So tell me a little bit about where you are sort of personally with this movement. Um, you were just in New York this weekend, did a great Time's Up event. But also, you've lent your support to some important legislation in California. So just give us a little bit of debriefing on that. OK. Um, yeah. So. I, you know, I've been an activist on many things for years. I've been a uh, Stop Violence Against Women campaign spokesperson for Amnesty International for three years. Um, and since 2009, I've been the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime Goodwill Ambassador Against Human Trafficking. And that's something that I continue to do. And uh, <laughs> thank you. But um, this year, it all became kind of personal, and I bet you guys know as much about my story as I <laughs> as I do. And thank you for sharing it, by the um, way. It's not an easy process. Thank you. Uh, but it finally became time where I felt like, OK, my own um, things that have happened to me personally actually matter enough that I should speak out about them, even though I've been speaking out on other things for years, but that I was also worthy of fighting for. Mm -hmm. and that if I could do that, I might help other people who've been through similar situations. And little did I know what the chorus would become. I did not know that this was going to be this wave that would spread not only throughout our business, but across the country. And help get Bill Cosby like put away. Like really, this is, and had that not happened, we would not have seen that, that verdict, maybe, I think. Maybe, maybe, yeah. you know, but, but we're seeing change across the globe. I mean, we're seeing Women and men of all cultures stand up and say, me too, that something has happened to them. They have been unfairly abused by someone in power. Um, and, uh, and by having such a groundswell of, of people raising their voices and supporting each other, now there is a stronger chance of justice for all of us and for changing the culture that has allowed perpetrators to get away with this sort of thing since time began. You know, I really don't think there has ever been a time in which sexual abuse and misconduct and rape hasn't occurred with impunity mm. because the victims never were in the pole position. Everyone has always been silenced by shame and okay. fear. Um, you know, it's very embarrassing. You don't want to tell people about it. You don't like reliving it. It's re-traumatizing. And the person who did it to you probably has more power than you. And that has been how it's always been. But now we're seeing change, and it's so kind of exhilarating to be a part of that. I mean, I didn't realize how wonderful it would feel to actually be in, an, in a movement that was meaningful to my generation and to my daughter's generation, mm -hmm. and that maybe we can start tipping the scales towards justice. Um, so that being said, all those years of activism with all of those other groups, which I still continue, especially with the human trafficking with the UN, has really led me to feel that awareness without action is, is hollow. It's the first step, but it's like a one-two punch. You have to have the action to follow up the awareness. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of people singing Kumbaya together, and then nothing changes. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so I was very thrilled when a group called uh, Equal Rights Advocates out here in California came to me and said, would you be willing to sponsor this slate of bills that we're proposing to the California legislature, which are among the strongest anti-sexual harassment bills in the nation. Mm -hmm. And we actually held an event here at SAG-AFTRA uh, at the end of March about them and with Gabrielle Carteris and a host of SAG members and also fellow survivors and uh, two state senators mm -hmm. and the lawyer who has been helping draft all of these laws, Noreen Farrell, and it was an incredible session because a lot of people shared their stories. And we heard from people in our business that had been harassed or assaulted by their agents. Mm. We heard from Christine Lottie that she was oh. told, she stood up and said, I was told when I entered the business that I was too tall and that I had an unusual look and therefore I would have to have sex with people in order to 
make any, any progress in my career, that I was going to have to sleep my way to jobs. And you know, to hear it put that bluntly, and I've heard that from many other people, um, and uh, you know, men were coming up, and people who said they were abused as children were coming up, and it was rife within our industry, I mean really rife, and there was this great need for things to change. And um, you know, I was looking back over the course of my career, and my earliest, my second audition, not the first one, but the second one, I was actually thrown into a chair, tied into it, because it was a horror movie, so they were trying to elicit fear, and uh, I was gagged by the casting director, and, and at the end of it, uh, as I examined the bruises on my arms, he said, oh, sorry about the prophylactic. As a 16-year-old girl, I was gagged with a condom at an audition. Now, what was he doing with a condom in his pocket at that audition? That's what I want to know. But at the time, I was so sort of, oh, okay, was, oh, did I act scared? I mean, you know, when you're right. that young, you just try and take everything in stride and you want to be tough. You want to show that you've got the metal to get the part to do the job, you know? Um, my father, a few weeks ago, when he heard the story, was like, why didn't you ever tell me this? And I was like, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't think to tell you. I don't know. I just didn't, I didn't think of it, you yeah. know? Um, it's but probably best he didn't know it. Maybe, yes. <laughs> uh, but then over the years, there were so many other circumstances. Like I was telling you about that yeah. absurd show called <laughs> New York Undercover Cop, which was a low budget movie that I did that I was thrilled to get cast in. It was a very big deal to get cast in it. But I played. <laughs> okay, so the leading man was a man named Tall Nakamura, who was a teen idol in Japan, and his name was Tall because he was very tall. And there were there were Quite calendars literal. of Tall, like Tall with a kitten, Tall, you know, <laughs> on a roof. You know, he, he was like a heartthrob, you know. And uh, and I was the part of his Puerto Rican girlfriend sculptress. <laughs> and get this. Chad McQueen was my brother, the head of a local biker gang, and I spent all this time studying the dialect, you know, interviewing Puerto Rican <laughs> people who lived in New York, trying to get it right, and Chad was like, hey, Toshi, you know, and he was like total <laughs> surfer Californian, and yet we were brother and sister. This, this movie made course, no sense no. at all. Um, <laughs> but, you know. You obviously were raised by different families. But yes. on, the, on the day of the love scene with me and Tall, all of a sudden, all of these extra producers show up on set. Oh, and they're all there, and they're all taking photographs, and they're all kind of getting really close. And it's like, what is happening? You know, what is happening? And, and you know, you just didn't have any recourse at that point. Yeah. Um, it's also, there were so few women behind the scenes. There were no women directing, no women producers, no women. I mean, yeah, I no mean, one I, to I just ha say. I have to say, in my early career, I did have a few female directors that I really loved. Like, Susan Seidelman was one of my directors. Right. Um, yeah. You know, I did have a few. but. But they were not, it was certainly not a 50-50 kind of crew. There was no yeah. sense of solidarity of like crew looking out for actors or vice versa. You were just there to show up and, and survive it. Um, and then one of the other things, and, and this is going to be my last story of the improprieties during, well, there's two. Uh, so on, on one of the biggest movies I got, ever had been cast in, after I won the Oscar, um, it was the first day on the set, and I was supposed to be taking off my sweatshirt to get a massage. And I was supposed to be in like gym clothes. And all of a sudden the director was like, you shouldn't be wearing a bra under your sweatshirt. Ugh. And I was like, oh, but I have a no frontal nudity clause in my contract. He was like, yeah, but it doesn't look right. And I was like, but I would never work out without a bra in like a, you know, like, As like most I, women I, I don't wouldn't. know, like I'd be wearing a sports bra. <laughs> I, can, I can wear a sports bra, you know, and no, 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 take it off. And, um, Eventually, it got to the point where he, and he was like, we won't see you. We're going to shoot you from the back. And I was like, but what about from this? And he was like, take it off or you're fired. Ooh. And this was the very first day. And of course, I was more worried about I'm going to get fired from this movie. And my agents are horrified. And everybody's trying to like mollify everybody. And it's all like, I'm going to lose the biggest job of my career so far because I don't want to do something that I was protected in my contract mm -hmm. from doing, and yet I ended up giving in. I did it. And of course, in the movie, you see a lot of side boob, but whatever. Um, the last weirdo story from the history, but these are, this is what just all SAG members, I think, and AFTRA members, mm -hmm. SAG AFTRA, are bound to experience in a long career, but even at the beginnings of one where they're the least powerful, right? But this was when I was in my power, right? This was when I was, I, I had, I, once again, it was post-Oscar, so one would say at that point I would have some leverage or some, 
gravitas or something. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm having a, a, a meeting audition at night in a rented house with a very big director who himself was an Oscar winner and is known as like a social justice director, hmm. really artistic. Okay, so I'm there and I'm talking to him and he's like, when I look at you, my mind can't help wandering from the artistic possibilities and the sexual ones. <laughs> and, and, and I think my mouth, I, I just kind of got that expression on say? my face. I just looked at him and in my mind, I know the interior monologue was like, oh, I thought this was like a legitimate <laughs> casting situation. Right. I thought I was here because you thought I'd be good for the job. I thought you thought my, you know, I was right for this character. I was going to bring something to the role. We were going to talk about the role. <laughs> oh, silly me, you know? <laughs> and, um, and I did not, and obviously he could read that. I, I, I don't know how I answered. I just mm. did not answer in kind. He was testing you in Yeah, I didn't say, yes, yeah. me too. Yes. yes. <laughs> and, um, so much to wonder about. Yeah, him. and so, you know, and, and he ended up casting a very famous actress who was married to a very famous actress, so I'm sure he did not do that to her. Right. But um, you were sort of more... Easy but prey, I, I, I was still, yeah. you know, kind of alone in the world, I guess you could right. say. So those were just this little panoply of experiences that I could just pull up quickly from my history to just to say that, you know, our industry is rife with that sort of abuse at every level, whether you're, you know, at your first audition or whether you're supposedly a, a bankable actress. Mm -hmm. um, but so these, these laws, um, if you are interested in following them, uh, there's a hashtag, uh, take the lead, and the group is called Equal Rights Advocates. Mm -hmm. And there are four, stat four laws that are, have already passed um, committee. Now they're going to the second house, and then they'd have to be signed by the governor. But basically, one of them deals with extending the statute of limitations from one year to three years. Now, a lot of us in this movement feel there should be no statute on sexual right. harassment or misconduct. But right now, for other business claims, they're usually more like two or three or even four years for other other kinds of uh, things that you could bring suit on. So we're trying to at least get parity with the other things that one could bring suit on. Um, that's a big deal because if you have something happen to you, it sometimes takes a really long time to process what it was and that it happened and to kind of marshal your forces and figure out what you want to do about it. Hmm. And oftentimes women in California or men in California have these things happen to them and then it's too late by the time they've realized they, they know what they want to do and they've gotten organized, the statute is gone. And the federal statute, by the way, is only 180 days. And the wow. terrible part, which I only really just became cognizant of this past weekend in talking to someone, is that in states without strong sexual harassment laws, uh, you are reliant only on federal laws. So you only have that 180 days. Wow. So if anyone is in a state that doesn't have as good laws as we have now with the one year, they have 180 days to, to file the complaint and then and bring suit. So, so that's one of the things that they're working on. Another, another part of these statutes is, and it's a slate, it's like they're bundled together. Um, it's about uh, every organization working in the state of California would have to have sexual harassment training to all of its employees. And that's different from now where you have to have a certain size organization and then it's sometimes only your top tier employees. So that means you have this millions and millions of people organizationally trained to be whistleblowers mm. and to know their rights. So instead of having something happen to you and other people are unsure what they're seeing and what to do about it, and most people just sort of like, you know, kind of not want to stick their own necks out about it. If they've all had this group orientation together and their consciousnesses are awakened, then maybe people will support people when this starts to happen and they'll report the wrongdoer. Or maybe the culture just shifts where people feel like, I'm not going to be able to get away with it because everyone here has just been told what I was going to do is, is right. not going to fly. Um, it, also, think of a film set. Like, think of if everyone on the set, if you're every gaffer, every uh, makeup artist, everyone knows the law and what right. is right and wrong and, and what you can do about it, what your recourse is, then if some young actress, her first day in the set is being bullied into taking her clothes off, maybe somebody reports that person or goes up and says, hey, you can't do that. You know you can't do that. 
And, mm. and that, that would be really awesome. <laughs> you know, another thing would be um, expanding the definitions. <laughs> but they want to expand the definitions specifically uh, of who could be a sexual harasser in a business relationship. It's not just your direct boss. It could be a director. It could be a producer. It could be a casting director. It could be an investor. Because a lot of people mm. are reporting that overwhelmingly investors harass people. Uh, you know, as a sort of holding out the carrot that like... And they're arguably the most powerful. Yes, if we give you the money to fund your project, we want something in return. Mm -hmm. And that's just, it's just kind of hellish. You know, mm -hmm. it's just wrong. And, and, you know, my feeling, I just, I just keep wanting to get this message out there that this world and our business should be a meritocracy. You know, we should be judged on the quality of our work, the contents of our character, and not whether or not we are willing to have a sexual relationship with someone in power. <laughs> So, and one of the last things that these bills do is it, it uh, brings liability to people who retaliate. So thus mm -hmm. far, it's not really specified in the law that there's penalties to retaliating against someone whistleblowing. Mm -hmm. um, these laws would make it that if a person, and it doesn't have to be the harasser, it could be someone in HR, it could be somebody else, if they retaliate against the person who was the whistleblower or the victim, then they are now civilly liable and they can be sued and they can have damages. So it just, it just kind of, we're slowly chipping away at this atmosphere of impunity and hopefully changing, changing the culture and empowering people to demand better of, of all of us. So, so that's, that's what I've been working on on the legislative side here in California and, and I'm really excited about it. And, and SAG-AFTRA has been involved in that. Um, and we did have that special day, but I'm sure there's stuff online about that. Uh, but anyway, it's hashtag take the lead. It's the equal rights advocates and any of you who want to support the legislation, there's a petition you can sign and you can write letters to our state senators. It, it's kind of exciting. Thank you so much. That's yeah. incredible. Thank you. So on to something a little bit lighter. <laughs> which is which is pretty much all things are lighter than that. <laughs> yeah. um, you were born in New York, but raised in New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, that's the light part. That was the, that was the lighter part. Um, what were you like as a kid? I, obviously, your father, Paul Servino, the great actor, was an early influence. But your mother was also an actor. My mother, Lorraine Davis, was an actress as well. Um, and but I she left the profession. She left it when she had me, and I always Aww. felt guilty about it. And she said she never, she never minded. So, Aww. and then once I had my own kids, I understood. Up until that point, I was like, "How could you not mind?" But um, you know, she, she just wanted to be a mom. So, did um, she discourage you from wanting to act? No, my dad discouraged me. <laughs> my dad discouraged me from doing it professionally. Hmm. But both of them were encouraging of me doing it as an amateur as a kid. So, okay. um, in my school, we did. My first play was called The Mystery of the Missing Capitalizations and Punctuations. <laughs> <laughs> or, the, or The Missing Caps and Punks. And my character was a teacher, a very eccentric teacher named Miss Big Brain. And I had a big gray wig and giant glasses and this oh polyester God. dress. Well, how old were you when you did this? Eight. Wow. I think. <laughs> possibly nine, but I think I was eight because I was always young for my grade. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and dad like started giving me acting lessons at that point. And he started <laughs> telling me how to create a character and how, how I had to work on the voice and mm. how to create, you know, a solid character that kind of was like I could maintain, that I didn't drop <laughs> out of it, um, and taught me how to prepare emotionally. Mm. And I don't know if it was that project. I think it was HMS Pinafore in fifth grade, but he taught me how to cry. Wow. And, you know, my dad... My dad has a you know a kind of formidable um, you know work ethic about this, and he always has said the day they use the glycerin tears is the day I walk out of the business. <laughs> uh, so he'll never use a blower. He'll never do any of that stuff. And, and he's hence, a purist. Hence, neither can I. Um, uh, so it would be anathema. I would be betraying the Sorvino family. Also, he's legacy. Italian. To, Italians yeah. like to cry. It's kind of sort of part of their DNA. It's true. But he basically had me climb up to the middle of the staircase. Um, and think about something very sad until I was weeping and then come downstairs and play the scene. And, <laughs> and, that, and that was, you know, and, but I learned, I learned it. I learned how to use my imagination and my, you know, my memories. And, and uh, 
And I was, you know, he was a Bill Esper graduate and Sandy Meisner mm -hmm. alumni. And uh, my mom and he met in Bill Esper's class as uh, scene partners. Mm -hmm. And uh, she Sweet. ended up teaching acting in our town in the public schools. And, uh, and then she worked with Alzheimer's patients. Yes, and she used wow. drama therapy to work with Alzheimer's patients to kind of re-socialize them and get them to wow. kind of free up their emotions and laugh and sing and dance. And I mean, she, she's really That's kind of amazing. heroic that way. Yeah. And tell me what went into your decision to want to attend Harvard and not pursue the Hollywood stuff right away. Um, Aside I was from that always being a, a really smart serious, decision, obviously. Well, I was a very serious student, <laughs> and I took my studies very seriously. And I got into Yale as well. And I was until May fifth or first or whenever the decision date was. I had filled out both cards, yes, and I couldn't decide which. And I knew Yale would be the straight, the drama route, you mm -hmm. know. But Yale was really close to home. Hmm. <laughs> and I wanted to be more independent. Like I wanted to get away from my family a little bit and try and live on my own and see how I would fare. You know, I, I felt like Yale was like Mother Yale and they would take care of everything. But I was within an hour and a half's drive of, of the house. And I, I just wanted to break free a little bit. I don't know. It was this independent streak in me. And, you know, Cambridge, Mass was far enough away that it would be an undertaking to go home for the weekend. And I kind of wanted to cut that cord a little bit. And... Hmm. And um, I don't really know why, but on that day, I finally sent in the Harvard card. Hmm. And tell me about living in China. That must have been life-changing. Uh, yes, and, and it would have been more so had Tiananmen Square not occurred, actually. Oh, wow. Because I went there. Okay, so the interesting part of the whole China story was I went there the summer between my junior and senior year um, to take third-year Chinese. And with a like a, a program, a foreign exchange program at, at Beijing University. Mm. And it was also the summer right after my parents broke up. Mm. And I was kind of devastated and I couldn't really focus in class back at school. You know, I, I, when I was in large lecture courses, I would just have like crazy, harmful, self-harm thoughts. And mm. I couldn't focus on what they were saying. I could only focus in small classes where, you know, you couldn't zone out. Mm. Um, and I, I just kind of... I don't know, I couldn't really handle being in school at that point. So mm -hmm. after the summer, I ended up finding a woman who was looking for a roommate, a Chinese woman who had a spare room. And although I had a student visa to continue in the fall, I decided to just stay and work. And I got some jobs and wow. I lived with her and I continued studying Chinese on my own um, and taking calligraphy. But I was teaching English at a middle school. I was uh, editing English language translations of Chinese magazines and uh, singing jazz with two different <laughs> mixed Chinese European jazz bands. And it was so much fun. They have like a Maxime's there. And I sang Satin Doll, Desafinado, and uh, one for my baby and one for the road at Maxime's Beijing. Oh my God. <laughs> That's and, and it was so much fun. I mean, and I'm singing in French. I'm singing Autumn Leaves in French. And, you know, <laughs> you know just. No one else has these stories, Mara. I have to tell you. <laughs> not a single other person in this town has these stories. You know, there's this whole expat life there. Mm -hmm. And at that point, there was no Western culture there. So you were kind of like, you were an ambassador for all things Western, including my fake book. Like people wanted me in their bands, not because I was such a good singer, but because I had the sheet music. Right. Like they right. didn't have the sheet music and jazz was this big underground thing. So happening. they just did it by ear? They just Well, they, they some they had some, but you know, there was no internet that you could take things off of, true, you know, yeah. and, and basically I had all the sheet music and everybody would take my sheet music and then they would let me sing a few solos. <laughs> <laughs> and my dad would send me more music and he would send me these care packages is full of like Techeco pasta and, and, and <laughs> like canned tomatoes and olive oil oh and God, I would cook Italian so food in this little kitchen. Um, but it was an amazing so experience and finally during that fall where finally it's, it felt like you know the whole summer as people spoke Chinese around me if they spoke Mandarin I felt like I was just almost getting it but they were just speaking a little too fast and then one day it was as though they slowed down. Like my brain somehow now had, you know, uh, accommodated to the to the speed, and I was now more fluent, and now I could wow. hear everything they were saying. It was like they were speaking more slowly, and I knew they weren't, but like my brain could hear them now. And, wow, what a uh, feeling, though. Yeah, it was really interesting. And then I would like bargain with people on the street, and bargaining's like a big part of, or it was then. I really don't know now. It's it's a totally different economy now, totally different lifestyle. Do you but think that that language skill helped you as an actor develop an ear for a dialogue? I think so. I mean, I think I always kind of had an ear because in our family. All of us, my brother, my sister, and my dad, uh, not my mother so much, but the three of us, we always um, 
tell stories and do the voices of the person <laughs> when we tell the stories. And for some people, that's very annoying, and other people find it amusing. <laughs> um, so, uh, but but it's a kind of a thing that you know. You, sometimes I feel like you either have an ear or you don't mm. for certain things. And well, people who are good at music are usually good at languages too. It's yeah. Sort of, so and sort of and, and Mandarin is a tonal language, and mm. it was very hard to remember the tones back in the U.S. But mm. once you were over there and you would hear a word said repeatedly with the you know Mao instead of Mao, like <laughs> you would realize that's the way to say it, and the tones would kind of mm. go in internally rather than just being something you were learning by rote on a page. Wow. And so yeah, by the end of my time there, I was researching my thesis topic, I was in these jazz bands, I was so excited and I was like, you know what, I'm going to come back after I graduate and I'm going to get another full-time teaching job and maybe I'm going to work on documentaries about shamanism in the far providen <laughs> provinces. And then I was friends with this woman who was, uh, she was one of the ADs, uh, one of the first ADs on The Last Emperor. Mm, and wow. uh, I think her name was Nin Ying and she wanted me to be a sort of reverse Yoko Ono for a Chinese Beatles. I'd be the, the American girlfriend for the Chinese Beatles and break up the band somehow. And uh, and so that was like the plan. I that was is such come a great back. movie concept. Like you have to write that. I would come back and I was going to do all these things and I had all these friends and I was so happy there. I'd kind of made a life for myself mm. and I'd kind of healed from the trauma of the divorce. Mm. And then... Um, I went back home, and that spring, as I was finishing, you know, one of my last semesters at Harvard, Tiananmen Square happened, mm. and it just changed all of our it was futures. 89, right? yeah. It was yes, it was eighty nine, uh, yeah. May of eighty nine, and I, I was like, oh wow, and none of us could go back because we were going to endanger our friends because the government at that point didn't want any Chinese people associating with foreigners. Right. We would be capitalist inroaders and right. pernicious influences and all kinds of bad things and we didn't want to endanger them but what was the point of being in china if you couldn't be friends with your chinese friends you know right. and also we none of us wanted to support wanted to act none of us wanted to act like nothing happened it was business as usual we're just coming back to be in your country after you've just you know right and fired your own people run right. over people with you know tanks and everything so um so that changed my horizons because i was going to go back to china after i graduated and instead i went on the road with this thing called Street Side Stories, which was this, <laughs> it was two brothers, the Brothers Levy, um, who were both cyclists. So they were biking across America, and every week we would stop at a different middle school, and we would try to convince kids to choose reading and writing over video games and TV, and we would do these <laughs> writing workshops with them where they would all write their own like plays and perform them at the end of the week, but then at the end of the week, we would move on to the next town on the list, and we were essentially homeless all weekend. And we were driving my mother's giant custom cruiser Olsenville <laughs> Woody <laughs> station wagon, which at that time was the largest car on the road because there were no SUVs at that point. Right. It was my boyfriend at the time who, he, you know, I got him hooked into it. So he was the photographer. I was the driver of my mother's Woody. And I would help as an assistant in the classes with the teaching. But then on the weekend, we had to, like, find housing. Mm -hmm. During the weeks, we'd stay with the people in the schools. But the brothers would bike 100 miles on the weekend, and then we'd arrive at some town <laughs> in the middle of nowhere and be like, at 5 p.m., like, hi, we're with Street Side Stories, an educational nonprofit. <laughs> like, <laughs> we, yeah. and, and we'd have to find a place to sleep. Were people welcoming? Sometimes. <laughs> but we, we literally spent the night in a jail. On the, we were literally locked into a cell by a friendly sheriff, and we spent the night on a jail floor. Like It was like the county jail, not like, you know, the federal or well, something. Well, at least it was the county jail. Yeah. And then we spent the night on a hospital. I can't even believe this now because I've become more germaphobic, but a hospital <laughs> dining hall floor. <laughs> like in our sleeping bags, like, and I'm like, what germs were we like just <laughs> sucking in? Um, one night we actually spent the night in a homeless shelter. Wow! Um, it was the West Pico Christian Men's Shelter, and we it was the only game in town. We drove up, and and there was a a form that we had to fill out, and it was the three guys and me, and it was like you were either Baptist or Roman. <laughs> like, you know, they gave you, t or not Christian. Like, so you were Those Baptist only or options. Roman. Okay. And I was like, ah, oh, Episcopalian? Does that kind of count as Roman? I mean, formerly Roman, like many light hundreds Roman, of years yeah. ago. Yeah, <laughs> Roman light, Catholic light, lazy Catholic. And, um, and then, 
<laughs> so we're sitting in there and it's this nice house and these people kind of run it like a house and we're watching TV with the other people who stay there and then they were like, well, it's 7.30, you want to take a shower? And I was like, well, I'm okay, thanks. Mm. Oh, it's 7.45, would you like to take a shower? No, I, I, I don't know. Actually, you have to take a shower. So I was like, oh, okay, okay, these were house rules. So I go into the shower, I pull back the shower curtain and there is a palmetto bug this big in the in in the tub, you know. And I was like, <laughs> so, so I just I just turned on the water and I stuck my head under it and got it wet, <laughs> just to pretend you're taking a shower. And, then, and just like went out and then they locked me in a garage because they, they we don't usually have women folk here, so I was locked in the garage, and about halfway through the night. I realized I was not alone in the garage, that there was some rather large creature in there with me. <laughs> it was oh some kind God, of so raccoon disturbing. or something. And, and it wasn't a rat. I mean, it was definitely a shuffling kind of, you know, <laughs> animal. That, <laughs> so I just, I just, I just, just, you know, stayed on top of the covers. I put my sweater over my pillow. And I think I was awake the whole night. I was like writing in my journal with my little flashlight and just staying awake. And just, you know. So acting was really like a fun departure compared to like what you just described. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, weirdly, and I, I, I should say, I should, Midway between sophomore and junior year, I was out in California, and I almost booked three leads in movies. Dead wow. Poets Society, Mystic Pizza, and one other movie that I don't remember. Wow, now. which which character in Mystic Pizza? Uh, I think it was the um, one played by Lily Taylor, but oh, wow. I, I'm not sure now. I don't remember. I never watched the movie afterwards, because sometimes you get sort of sour grapes and you don't watch the movie. Understandable. Anymore, especially when you're 18. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I... But I was, you know, achieving some success in my auditions, and I was like, okay. And so I'm like doing laps in my dad's pool because my dad was living out there at that time, and and I was like, I'm gonna get the next one. I'm gonna get the next one. I'm gonna get the next one. And in my mind, I was like, all right. So maybe I'll take a semester off, and I'll take six months off, and I, and I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll get some jobs, and then I'll go back. And I'm doing some more laps, and then I was like, okay. But it's gonna take two years to get my career off the ground, and. In two years, all my friends will graduate. And then I'll probably never go back to school. And I'll never graduate, because I'll just be an actress. And then my dad was like calling Warren Beatty. And he was like, Warren, <laughs> tell Mira she cannot drop out of Harvard. You know, she has to. And then and so he put Warren on the phone with me. And then Warren was like, well, you could at least transfer to Columbia so you could go on auditions. <laughs> my dad's like, Warren, that's not what I told you to do. You're not helping. <laughs> uh, so, so then I, I, you know, I went back to school. And, mm -hmm. and at that point, I sort of abandoned my you know, professional trying to be an actress for the remainder of being in school. Like Before mm -hmm. that, every summer I was auditioning, and I was taking Bill Asper's summer, summer class. And you know, throughout college, I participated in about five productions at Harvard, and I also directed a play. I directed After the Fall, hmm. um, Arthur Miller's amazing play, sort of about Marilyn Monroe, and, yeah. and I had seen it on Broadway, uh, an incredible production um, with Frank Langella and Diane Weist playing the Marilyn character, and oh, wow. it was extraordinary. It was amazing, hmm. and uh, I had seen it when I was like 16 and a half, and she was extraordinary as Marilyn Monroe. I mean, she was... You know, she, she has a voice too, she but, a but she voice. had the fragility and she had the sensuality, which usually I don't see her playing those parts of her instrument, but she was. Right. Um, so, I mean, I, I had a fantastic experience at, at, at school, and but once I got out, it started calling to me again, and I was mm -hmm. like, you know what? I think I have to be, I think I have to be an actress. And and at that point, when I told my dad, you know, I, I dad, I, I I think I really that's acting is for me. And he was like, well, then I give you my blessing. Because be <laughs> before that, he had said, you should only be an actor if it was the only mm. thing you want to do. If there was anything else you wanted to do equally, you should do the other thing because you weren't going to fight as hard as it was going to take to be, be successful, and you wouldn't be able to handle all the rejection and the ups and downs. Right. And obviously, I want to make sure that we talk about Mighty Aphrodite, for which you won your Oscar. This is always exciting. Um, and and Avi, uh, excuse me, not Avi. Obviously, um, the Woody Allenness of it all has become complicated as of late. Um, and you have, of course, said that you will will not work with him again. And you wrote a very nice letter to his daughter, uh, who we all feel, you know, so intensely for. Um, but are you able to look back on the movie and separate the, 
the present from the past and just appreciate the work you did because you were very extraordinary in this movie. Oh, thank um, you. And so was Woody. It's a great movie. I was watching clips of it today and it's just it's a it's a an achievement. Um, so when you see your Oscar, are you able to appreciate what you did? I'm still really grateful for the Oscar. I would never, you know, people were like, "Are you going to return your Oscar?" And I'm like, "No, no, I, I, I did the work." Um, and beat out some incredible actors. You had Joan but, Allen, and but had you know. I known all the circumstances, had I understood, then perhaps I would not have taken the job in the first place. So for that, I am in the wrong for not not digging deeper at the time, because but those allegations were out there then. Yeah. Yeah. But at that time, you know, Dylan was a child and. We were believing adults' versions of the story over her own story, which she has stuck to steadfastly all these years. And I've I've since become friendly with her, and she is a lovely, amazing person. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I had a tremendous experience working on that film, and it pains me deeply that it, you know, the whole thing is kind of marred by, you know, what has unfolded and what we understand now. Um, but it, it was an extraordinary experience for a young actress. It was it was an amazing. How did how did you grow as a performer? From and I know it was a grueling experience. Um, well, I, you know, I, I I created such a crazy character on that one. Um, she was so extreme that I literally was you know talk about my dad teaching me to stay in character. <laughs> I was so afraid I was going to fall out of that character that I went on a on a trip to Philadelphia in character before the movie started. Wow! I took a train. Uh, for weeks, I had been walking around Manhattan dressed like her in like crazy high heels and brightly colored clothing and like hair and a like fountain ponytail off the top of my head. <laughs> and, uh, you know, doing like just just trying pieces of her out with people, like mm. going into stores as her. But the then voice I, is very. Unique. Yeah, well, that's when I was working on the voice. Because I remember, you know, I was asked to do a voice because not only was she cheap, but she's stupid. So the voice had to somehow reflect these things. And then ultimately, I, I had this like piece of paper where I was like, Californian? No. Southern? No. High? Maybe. <laughs> Minnie Mouse? Eh? Gravelly? Maybe. And then I remembered there's this um, an ex boyfriend of mine had a mother who had a very high voice, naturally. It was a very high voice. And I tried to emulate that, but then put some gravel into it just to make her sort of someone that really could never be successful in in the business with a speaking voice, you know, like a <laughs> right. voice. You know, right. Just like some people have a, a face made for radio, they say. Right. She had a voice made for the silent movies. <laughs> so, uh, um, so and, and then I just I took this train down to Philadelphia as, and I spent like the whole weekend as her and talked to people as her and. It really helped me refine like what people loved about her. Like people just would kind of find her really disarming and funny, and they didn't know how to take her, but they enjoyed her and they liked her. Right. And I negotiated for a camera lens in character, and I was like, "Oh, but the blue book here says that the value for this well, it really should be two hundred. <laughs> oh, oh, oh! Let me see that. Oh, it does. Yeah, and she has such a charm too. There, yeah, it's not well, just she she's not a, just a ditz. I mean, there's there was something very soulful about her, despite. Yeah, Her no, occupation. she had, and well, she had a delight. She had a love of life, mm -hmm. a kind of zest for things, a kind of <laughs> glee. But she also had this secret of this lost child that she had right. given up for adoption that she really did mourn every day. She thought about him every day. And, um, and that was one of the things that was said by the director afterwards in print. He said, you know, I set out to write the greatest Bulgarian ever written, and Mira brought all this like heart to the character that I didn't know was there. Hmm. And I was like, but of course it's there because there's this whole story about the child. Like it would it was in the writing. It was there. Yeah. I just think, you know, sometimes But how interesting for him to say that you discovered something in his script that he didn't know existed. But you know, yeah. my father always says, you know, he always says, you know, half of writing is subconscious. So writers mm -hmm. don't often see half of what they wrote. Right. Um, and Woody has written a lot of incredible scripts. I mean, despite Everything, it's hard to negate that. He's an incredible writer. So one of my favorite movies, uh, maybe it's because I was in college and I just love the ensemble, was Beautiful Girls. And I would love to know, uh, I know, so good. I will always watch it when it's on. Um, and Ted Demi, who of course we sadly lost about six years after the movie came out, um, great, he was so great with actors. Tell me what it was like shooting, I think you shot in Minnesota, yeah. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. um, we had Uma, Matt Dillon, Rosie O'Donnell, Tim Hutton, Michael Rappaport, Martha Plimpton, Natalie Portman in her first major role after The Professional. 
What was it like working with all these people who were your peer group? It was kind of your biggest ensemble movie at that point. Yeah. Um, and I think that I did it before Mighty Aphrodite came out. Oh, okay. So it was that post-Oscar movie, it, people, that it was it like the, maybe out, the first thing we saw after the, you'd it won? It came out after that, but I shot it before it. I see. Okay. Yes. Because it came out in the winter. I remember and my yeah. salary. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm pretty sure. It was the yeah. pre-Oscar salary, right? <laughs> yes, very much so. But, um, <laughs> but it was also, yeah. And so I remember being really excited to work with all these people. They were people I had admired you know, much of my youth. Um, and I was playing Matt Dillon's girlfriend, and that was I mean, very heady. Um, <laughs> but I was playing Matt Dillon's girlfriend that he's cheating on with Lauren Hawley. And right. I was supposed to have an eating disorder right. in the show, and they kind of cut out most of the references to that. But during the shooting, I was trying desperately to get as skinny as possible. So my schedule was such that I was in Minneapolis for long chunks of time, while all the other women were sort of flown back in and forth. So, and, and the guys, when they were on the set and I had nothing to do, like if it wasn't a day where I was actually shooting, all the other characters were working and I was alone in Minneapolis trying not to eat. And, <laughs> oh, no. and I was, you know, remember Ma Wong? Remember those drops that were, you know, and they were, you know, diuretic and heart, you know, speeding and oh, no. supposedly mm -hmm. helped you, you know, lose weight. So I was drinking water infused with mawang all day long and trying to eat like a tiny amount and wandering around Minnesota like really lonely with no one around. <laughs> so that was largely my, my, my memory of shooting beautiful girls, although obviously I worked with great people and, and Tet Demi was so wonderful. Oh. But it was sort of like a lonely experience. That, is, that does sound a little lonely. Did you make any good friends on that production you, to be, you're, you're still close with? Well, actually that's when I got to know Natalie and we're still friendly and oh. you know, she came to visit me and Paris um, one time and she's a fellow Harvard yes woman. and mm -hmm. I really respect her so much and we saw each other at the women's March oh. this winter and, and uh, I'm just really proud of the woman she has grown into she's, she's a, really a very impressive person yeah yeah um, and then speaking of Marilyn Monroe that was another breakthrough performance for you 1996 the HBO film yeah with your sister in, in activism, Ashley yes, Judd, yes. which is kind of incredible to think the two of you <laughs> had that experience together. And also playing a woman who was obviously such at the center of everything we're talking about in terms of her perception and the way she was treated. Um, how did that role test you in ways that you didn't expect? Oh, well, that was, I mean, come on, Marilyn Monroe. I mean, there's not a bigger <laughs> monolith to And if you remember, a um, Ashley played Norman Jean and you played Yes, Marilyn. it was this strange yeah. psycho kitty thing where we were right. two halves of the same person. Right. So, um, but it worked, oddly. It, was, it did. It was very it was, well done. And Tim yeah. Feiwell directed it. It was HBO. It was a really interesting, interesting show. And um, it sort of tracks her early life and her abuse and then you see this ambitious young woman, Norma Jean, and then once she becomes like uh, the blonde icon that she became, it's played, I am Marilyn, her creation. Right. But it's like, sh my character's like the vulnerable one, mm -hmm. the childlike one that is sort of the eternally kind of sad but hopeful child right. with all that sexuality, and she's the one who's still fighting back and ambitious and mm -hmm. angry, and I'm like more sad, and and we have these kind of conflicts over things. But um, I had long been a huge Marilyn Monroe fan. When I was a teenager, I grew up in a rather, I would say, strict kind of traditional family values kind of house. Especially my mom was very kind of you know almost fundamentalist in her you know reading of, of Christianity and mm -hmm. morality, and so. People who were, you know, overtly sexual, you know, we had been taught were sort of kind of like fallen women. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, that's kind of how it was. It, not, not by my dad, but my mom. That was really more her hmm. take on things. And uh, and I love my mom dearly, so this is not a slam on mom. It's just kind of mm -hmm. how she Parents saw Parents are complicated like that. Yeah, right? and, uh, and here was Marilyn, and I, you know, kind of discovered her when I was 16. And I was like, but look, she's so lovable and innocent and like there's such beauty and happiness coming from her and she's very sexual and the two are together in her and so it's not a bad thing so here was this sexual woman who was not a vamp who was not a femme fatale she was and you know maybe this was part of her tragedy too that everyone saw her as this repository for their good and bad urges and whatever but um 
but she was wonderful and appealing and, and innocent. There was an innocence to her, even though she was so sexual. And I love that about her because it was kind of my rebellion from what I had been taught hmm. was the way of the world and how women were to be seen. And She um, seemed to be the first icon who had that duality. Mm-hmm. Where, because usually back then you were one thing or another thing. Yes. And yes. she seemed to, those things coexisted in her and we're still obsessed with her. Yeah. I mean, there isn't a, there isn't a day well, that she goes was so by that people don't too, though. I mean, what a her. brilliant actress and yeah. comedian. And people really never gave her her due in her mm-hmm. time. And she was a businesswoman and, you know, she was thwarted by some of the men in her life and by the studio system. But she mm-hmm. was producing movies before women were producing movies. Um, you know, she started that production company with Milton Green. Uh, I mean, Laurence Olivier really did her a disservice. I think he really kind of messed with her on um, The Prince and the Showgirl. But uh, anyway, she she was an extraordinary light, and I was so excited to play her, but I was so nervous because she was my idol, and here I was playing my idol, and I could never be her. Wow. You know, uh, I could never even approach her level of of loveliness, of beauty, of talent, of comedic timing. And... and um, and I was remembering, because one day in New York, I was walking around before the show, and I walked into a, a costume depot, used clothing place, and they had her dress from the Misfits, the cherry dress of with the, the white silk dress with cherries. And they, it was her original dress, and they had it like in a case. And I said, oh my gosh, I'm playing Marilyn Monroe for this movie. Is there any way we could rent this? And they rented it. Wow. So I had a scene one day where I'm sitting in a car, and it's supposed to be like a fight between me and Arthur Miller wearing that dress. And I started to have a panic attack in my trailer. I was mm-hmm. like, how can I do this? I can't. How can I? I can't. And I was wearing the dress. And then I was all of a sudden, I was like, okay, wait a second. You can't be her. That's true. You'll never be her. You will never. No, only she was Marilyn. Mm. Therefore, this is your homage to her. Mm. This is what you think you understand about her, what you've learned about her. I did so much research on her. And you just try and do this homage to her. And that's what it's going to be. It's not, you can't be her. So take that off of yourself because you can't be her. And it's like, I almost like prayed to her for forgiveness. It was like, I could, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. <laughs> and that freed me up. Well, it, it, a, like, it, it gave me this license too, to just, right. you know, go out there and do my best. And, and um, one of the most amazing compliments I ever got was uh, Winona Ryder was working with Arthur Miller on, I believe, The Crucible right. right around the time that it came out. And he watched the movie and he said to her, who is that girl that played Marilyn? How did she understand her pain? Wow. wow. And I was like, oh, that was like just one of the best things that, you know, I could have ever heard. So, I mean, it's sad, but it's also, it was wow. amazing. So that was one of my best, my best career accomplishments was hearing that. Um, but, you know, I did a lot of work on her voice and her facial mannerisms. Like I went to the Museum of Television Radio to listen to radio interviews with her because I wanted to hear what her voice sounded like when she wasn't on camera Mm. to see if it was any different. Was it different? Well, it was in that she would also go lower with it. You know, Mm. she'd still have those moments where it was high and breathy, but then she'd go kind of go down too. And she'd she'd kind of talk more (laughs) frankly. And I can't do it as well as I (laughs) could do it then. But I I worked on all of her plosives and her T's and N's and everything. And then I also said, and I was living at the Chateau Marmont. They put me up there because I was from New York. So I had this little bungalow there. And I felt like I was living in this sort of time warp. (laughs) And I I I was playing this, I I don't know if it was River of No Return. I I don't remember what movie it was. But I'm playing a scene in the VCR because then we still have those tapes. Mm -hmm. And I'm playing it and I'm videotaping myself doing her lines in the scene just to figure out how she moved her mouth and her eyes and her all of her you know kind of mannerisms as she spoke and I did it back and forth until my face seemed like hers in terms of the movements and wow. usually I never work in front of a mirror I never use any sort of video but because I was portraying a historical figure that we have so much of a video log on right. I felt like I had to do that so it was a thrill of thrills to play her, and I, I cherish that as one of my favorite cinematic experiences. Wow. And to hear Arthur Miller say that is, <laughs> that's, that'll keep you going for a while. <laughs> and on to something totally different but equally magical, which is Romeo and Michelle's high school reunion. <laughs> really, 
really a truly wonderful movie. Thank um, you. None of us looked at post-its uh, the same way again. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so this, and, and I'd actually been reading about this movie last year in the 20th anniversary just because I wanted to revisit the source material, and it was a play originally, which yes, I didn't realize. Yes, called The Ladies' Room. Yeah. Right, and Robin Schiff had written the play, and then she wrote the screenplay. Yes, because there were two characters, sort of like the Rosencrantz and Guildenstern of the play, right. Romy and Michelle, that sort of took the audience... You know, they, they sort of, they loved those characters. So. Right. And how did how did Robin get to actually make this into a feature? Because it doesn't, you know, that doesn't always happen. <laughs> Especially like a little known play. What was, how did the source know. material travel? It might travel? have been because of Lisa Kudrow's involvement. Okay. I don't know. So they attached Lisa first and then yes. you were cast after that. Yes. Okay. And did you know Lisa previously? No. Okay. Did and you? I had not watched Friends either. I was not. Really? <laughs> I didn't watch much TV at that time. Well, the two of you are like these brainiac um, college ladies too. <laughs> I bet you hit Lisa it off. Lisa is brilliant. She's, she was almost she's a doctor. Bright. I know. Everybody I remember. Everybody in her family is a doctor and she was, going, she was you know, pre-med and then she decided she had to act instead. And did you, the two of you worked together to create these characters and you talk about the voice work you did in Maryland. Your voice is very different in this movie. It's very low. Did you work together to make sure each of them was distinct? No, I mean, I just kind of worked on mine. I, I based it off of my sister, because my sister, as a kid, had this kind of valley girl speak, even though we lived in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> and she had, you know, yeah, okay. You know, she, she kind of did that stuff, and then I sort of co-opted it. I'm always stealing, you know. Um, well, you but, have that good ear, so you're, you're cataloging all these sounds. But, you know, I probably made it even lower than my sister's voice because I wanted her to be the man of the relationship. Like, <laughs> it, it was kind of a couple in a weird way, like right. a sort of platonic couple. And, like, there was, like, I was the idea man in my mind. You know, <laughs> right. like, I, I'm an idiot, but I, I, I think of myself as the smart one and, it, <laughs> right. and, and kind of the more butch one. Right. Um, and, uh, and, that, and I decided I wanted her to walk like a linebacker in heels. <laughs> Yeah, so She's not the most her, graceful. When yeah. you see me walking to, to Ramon's office, you know, <laughs> bent on getting him to agree to lend us his car for the right. reunion, like that's where you see that linebacker walk. <laughs> <laughs> and did you realize at the time that what you were making was very special? I know most actors have really no sense until it's wrapped or until you actually watch it. But um, did you know that you had kind of hit on something, like the alchemy was there, the comedy was kind of spot on? Uh, well, I, when I read it, I just thought it was so hilarious, and uh, I was laughing out loud when I read the script. I was cracking up. Now, when my agents saw the script, they were like, Mira, this is not really like Oscar year material. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I was like, but it's so good. This is so funny. Mm -hmm. You know, this is one of the funniest things I've ever read. And, you know, because it was a little vulgar on the page, too. There yeah. were some parts of it that were, are not in the film anymore that mm -hmm. were a little bit more, a little gross-out humor. Um, and I'm kind of glad they're not in there. But, uh, but we also made it more of a nerd anthem, you For know, sure. pay into friendship and, and self, you know, self-belief. Like the whole scene where we confront the mean girls was not originally in the story. Mm. And I, I fought for that. I was like, Robin, I was a nerd in high school. I know. You know, you need your, your comeuppance. You need your, your moment where they confront, the where, they're where they're strong and brave, you know, mm -hmm. even if they're ridiculous as they do it in, <laughs> in my Star Trek dress. <laughs> that, that was like <laughs> and had you been to any high school reunions yourself? I have not. Oh, See, that's the crazy part. Those things like stick with you. Like, you still can. You have many more ahead of you. I know. And I, you know, I've been to my college reunion, my 25th. And I, and I loved college so much, so that was such a delight to go back there, but also bittersweet because like they have the reunion stuff happening in the freshman yard. And you're walking around there with your friends that you haven't seen in years maybe, and you're remembering when you were all 17, 18 years old walking around that yard freshman week for the first time. And it's overwhelming. And like, what, where has the time gone? I still feel like that same person, but I'm, I'm you know, 25 years older, and I have a family and a life and a history, and you know, um, yeah. But yeah, so no, I have not gone to my high school because <laughs> I'm still afraid of the mean girls. <laughs> <laughs> I have a sense you'd be the belle of the ball at this point. <laughs> Did, and, and it's funny to hear your agent say that, which is always a struggle. You know, what is the material that an Oscar winner should pursue? How did your career change after the Oscar? Did you find yourself? you know, access to material that you wouldn't have before? Because a lot of actors say their careers don't change. Um, Octavia Spencer was very open about that when she won, that it isn't this automatic free pass to sort of any project you want to do. No, it wasn't any project you want to do, but I got a lot more opportunity. You got a lot more, okay. Yeah. Um, and, you know, maybe I didn't 
choose as wisely as I should have that year. I, I still stand by my um, my Romy and Michelle choice. Um, <laughs> we all stand by your Romy and Michelle choice. But maybe choice. I should have done, you know, more Shakespearean. No, no, no. no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's enough of that out there. But you did make an interesting choice in doing Mimic with yes. Del Toro, which I think was also very, it Well, was I the did same it because year. of him, because right. I met him and I fell in love with his, like, dark Gothic poetry, you know, how He must have been so young. How old was. was he at the time? Like, early 30s? I think so. Yeah. It's I his mean, second he's a feature. genius and I could see it. And, you know, perhaps it would have been more propitious to wait until he was doing his second movie and not do the one that was about giant cockroaches because <laughs> there is a kind of, and my father was like, Mira, people do not like cockroaches. <laughs> and I was like, well, Jennifer Lopez is doing a giant snake movie. <laughs> and he's like, that's different, that's a snake. <laughs> he said, there's something instinctual, this instinctual disgust people have for insects. But I did, I would, I mean, the name Anaconda was in the title, Mimic, we wouldn't have known that it was about cockroaches, well, necessarily. Well, you watched the ads. <laughs> there was one scene where like thousands of them were like crawling all over. And the, the bug itself, the, the creature was just horrifying. It was, I mean, it, it literally job. carries me off and flies away into a subway tunnel. So, you know, look, for the genre, it's excellent. It's a very well Should done Should I have movie. done a genre movie that year? Probably not. Okay. And Replacement Killers was also a genre movie in a way. Okay. So I probably should have followed Romeo and Michelle with some serious Oscar caliber stuff. And I didn't. And, you know, we'll never know what would have <laughs> happened. But, uh, you I know. I think it worked out just the way it should have. <laughs> And tell me what it was like to work with Spike Lee on Summer of Sam. Ah, uh, uh, that was that was really a wonderful experience. Um, Again, another amazing ensemble. Yes, and the amazing thing about Spike is, and, and I had been sort of loosely attached to that script in an early, earlier incarnation of it. Um, Michael uh, Imperioli had co-written it, right. along with Victor Colicchio, I believe, and uh, they were going to make it themselves. Hmm. And at a certain point, I was kind of attached to it and maybe Benicio del Toro was part of it and like I was but I was the other role I wasn't Deanna I was the other role the Jennifer right. Esposito role and then uh, it came to new life with Spike and Spike kind of rewrote the script and added his own flavor to it and then I got cast um, and I was very excited about it and Michael still plays a small role in it and that was after he'd started Sopranos too so it was People knew him. At yeah, that point. but he was originally going to play the part that Adrian Brody played. And, oh, interesting. You know, I love Michael, and I think he's genius. He's I mean, great. we did a movie together called Sweet Nothings, and he's so brilliant in it. And I, um, I would, I, I love Adrian, but because Michael wrote it, I kind of wish Michael had had the shot to play it mm. just for himself. Right. But um, because it, you know, anyway. But uh, um. So Spike was very improvisational. So we hmm. did these rehearsals before the, the show, before we started shooting, and um, and the wonderful John Leguizamo and I hmm. would workshop our scenes with Spike. And we'd st he'd have us improv, and then he would write down things we were saying and add them to the script. So the scenes changed wow. to be you know deeper and more related to the characters that we were building and the specific relationship we were building. And then on the day, Spike would use two cameras. Most of the time, he would shoot like that on on like a, a you know a, a scene with two people. So your reaction was organic with the other side, which almost never happens in film because you're mm -hmm. always shooting a master, right. a, you know, a two shot, then a close up, and a close up, and then an extreme close up. And when you're doing your close up, the other person is off camera. And then when vice versa. So the moment is always uh, reconstituted in the editing room. But when you're shooting two cameras at once, you can get the same moment when I say something to John and he says something back to me, we're living in that moment. Mm. And that made it very kinetic and very exciting. It also allowed for things that I thought were amazing. Like, and I know people now will see this as one of these stories of abuse, but it was not. Because this is where, because you know, when you have a certain level of trust with each other, you you say, okay, this is the scene. We have to actually, you know, uh, we, we have to go for this couple. This couple is this this emotionally violent couple. Like we, we we're destroying each other in a way. We're in a in a in a marriage that is going right. south because of all kinds of issues, and so. Spike whispered to, to John before one of the takes, spit in her face. And because John and I trusted each other so much, I was like game for whatever John was going to throw at me. 
you know, it was going to be fine and vice versa. So he spit in my face and I slapped him. And that's there in the film and it works and it was truthful, but it's because the trust was there between all of us. Right. It wasn't one of those weird things where a director was like popping some weird Hitchcockian, like manipulative, like, you know, now. Like you weren't in on the joke kind of, but right. everyone else no, was. We, we right. knew and loved each other enough, all of us, that this was like sacred ground and we had each other's backs and we were mm. in this safe place where we were going to see where these characters were going to go and I felt safe. Hmm. Um, the only bad day I had on that movie was the day that we did the Plato's Retreat scene. And that, you know, Plato's Retreat, probably most of you will be old enough to remember what it was, but it was a sex club in New York in the 70s. And, um, <laughs> and I never went to the actual Plato's Retreat. I think it was closed by the time I came of age. But um, we recreated it, and we had a room full of naked or semi-naked extras. Actually, all the extras were naked except for me and John. And John was wearing a sock. And I was wearing an elaborate <laughs> tape thing on my chest and some kind of small <laughs> kind of G-string type thing. But to give the illusion that on camera we're fully naked because, you know, as little clothing as possible while we were still actually covered. But we're in the midst of these, this room that's supposed to be this group orgy. And this is, you know, this is part of the story and this is what was happening there and everything. But all the rest of the actors were really you know, going, going for it. For it. <laughs> so with this room of simulated sex at really high volume, everybody's like hooting and hollering and it's like, you know, really, ah, ah, you know, everybody's just going nuts all around us and we're all these bodies kind of slamming up against each other. And I am in a threesome, like with this man and this woman and, uh, and I'm sort of in the middle and, and all of a sudden he's like, want to mix it up a little, do it doggy style? And, and, and I was like, oh, oh that, that's okay. I'll just, I'll just keep it this way because like, I, just, I just was like, oh, my God. And I, and I felt by the end of it that I was a porn actor. And, it, and I, it wasn't what I you know, became an actor to do. Right. And so I remember crying at the end of it and telling Spike that you know, it was a really hard day for me. And he was very sympathetic. And you know, I wasn't made to do anything I didn't want to do, but it was it was just a little too vulnerability making for me, and it was not comfortable for me to be like pressed up against all these other naked people, like simulating sex. There was for enough hours going on in the rest of the movie to probably you know, there was a lot going on in that movie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, that scene was not a, the most important scene. Um, so the human trafficking series I know was very important to you. Two thousand five. Was was doing that series what got you so impassioned about this project, and or were you already involved in your work? Combating that I was already point. involved. The reason I did the movie is because I was working on that with Amnesty International okay. as part of their Stop Violence Against Women campaign that I was spo spokesperson for. Um, I had discovered the phenomenon of human trafficking, which is modern day slavery, which is you know an illegal form of slavery as opposed to the chattel slavery of the past or the legalized prison industrial complex slavery that we still have in this country. Um, this is an illegal subterranean form of slavery which affects over 30 million people across the globe. It's in the hundreds of billions of dollars of profits for the criminals. It's uh, second only to um, <coughs> arms and, uh, well, it's, I think it's tied for second with arms trading. The first is, is drug trading. But wow. it's a huge, huge um, organized crime issue. It affects every country in the globe including the U.S. Uh, we have one to three hundred domestic minors trafficked for commercial sex at any given moment here. So we have hundreds of thousands of our own children, American children, who are um, trafficked for sex. And, you know, we like to say there's no such thing as a child prostitute. Anyone in prostitution under the age of 18 is a trafficking victim. And that stands for child porn and all, you know, all, any kind of commercial sexual exploitation. Um, but we're trying to flip the script on a lot of the ways that people perceive uh, people in prostitution too. Um, and you so. said, I saw a video where you, you did an event with Ron Wyden, who's actually a senator mm -hmm. from my home state of Oregon, really great guy, where you said there's to try to dispel the idea of the happy hooker, which you said that you had sort of created yeah. in Mighty Aphrodite, the idea yeah. that there are women who enjoy this line of work. Right. And you well, said, there are some. I mean, yeah. look, and, and I, I am not knocking sex workers. That's their choice. Right. The problem is that most studies have said that 
the number of sex workers, the percentage of sex workers who are actually free agent, who actually don't have a pimp right. or are Working in some degree of force, whether it's full-on trafficking or a situation, a, a forcible situation where they are not making most of their own money, where they are kept drug addicts, where they are in fear of their enforcer, um, is about 2 to 5%. Mm. And that's being generous. So the top of the pyramid are the free agent sex workers. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of outrage among the sex workers about the shutting down of Backpage and other similar websites that are, you know, soliciting prostitution online. But those websites were responsible for selling children, mm. a great number of children. Um, you know, over 100,000 children a year are sold in this, and most of it's done online now. Mm. So while I appreciate and sympathize uh, with their plight and their feeling that this has massively inconvenienced them to the point of where they feel that it is less safe for them and that they must perhaps return to the street, and I sympathize with that, I do not feel that those websites should keep open to sell children and to sell all the other women, men, trans people, non-binary people who are exploited um, as victims of sexual exploitation because that's the majority of people in sexual exploitation. It's, it's the, mi the tiny minority of sex workers so, uh, who, who run their own lives. So you have to think of the greater good and when you have to think of children being raped daily 30 times a day by adult men who buy them online, I think the answer is clear what needs to be done. But, you know, people right. will be angry at me for saying that. Well, <laughs> it sounds right to us. Oh. And thank you for your work, working on that. It's very important. Um, before we get to audience questions, I did want to mention you've done a lot of very fun TV work over the years. And I must say my favorite moment ever of television is you playing yourself on Lady Dynamite. <laughs> I don't know if you guys saw this, but the most absurdly wonderful television show in the history of TV, which sadly we only had two seasons. Two seasons, yeah. Um, but tell me, first of all, how you <laughs> did Maria Bamford ask you to play yourself? Did you already know her before? No, before the show? I got offered to do it through the casting director. Um, uh, and it was like a, a weekend thing, like, quick, can Mira work on Monday on Lady Dynamite? Um, we're looking for an actress to sort of play herself, but then it's like a show within a show, like fourth <laughs> right. wall breaking, all kinds of craziness. And so I had been working on a voice for the character, and I kind of wanted to do this kind of high, like a little dizzy, like straight voice. <laughs> and, then, and then what happened was I got there, and that's kind of how Maria sounded. That's exactly how Maria sounded. <laughs> and, and so I said that to the showrunner, and I was like, well, I was going to do this voice, and I showed it to her, but then I just was in the dressing room with Maria, and she's going to think I'm imitating her. And she was like, well, what if you do, like, one voice for, like, when you're playing the character in the sitcom? Right. And then afterwards, when you're backstage, you do that other voice, so you're out maria in Maria, and she'll be all freaked out. And then I was like, but then, what if... I'm actually British. <laughs> so then I do this whole soliloquy where I start doing, you know, out, out, damn spots, you know, <laughs> all the perfumes of Arabia. <laughs> you know, I just, and then at the end, I'm at my Prius, which isn't my Prius, but, uh, and she comes out and she's like, oh, Mira Servino, I just want to say it was great working with you. And, you know, and oh, it's just, uh, but this is the real you, right? And I was like, I don't know, Maria, is it? And I get into the car, and, I, and it takes off as a spaceship into the sky. <laughs> that was one of the most fun days I've had on a set in a long time. And then the next year, person. I went back, and I did another episode mm -hmm. where I p play Ron Liff, the Hive Queen. And it's like a scene out of old Star Trek. And I mean that in the best way, because I'm a huge <laughs> old Star Trek fan. But I'm in this like underground, like fake rock cavern <laughs> with all these styrofoam, you know, like igneous rock and I'm inside an egg with like a clear front and it's really a sauna egg but I don't know this is you know, a real thing yeah. but it, it has a, like a top that you know opens like with hissing steam and and but I'm inside like you know uh I don't know I, I don't know what you call it maybe hibernating and like <laughs> she comes in and she comes in with a sword and, and she has to open it with through a tongue slot. She's got to stick her tongue into the egg, and it's, Roland, I'm here to save you! And, and, and I come out, and I'm like, evil. And, I have the, and she's got a sword, and I take it from her, and then I'm like licking the sword, and I'm in love with like, the, you know, the, 
th there's this computer that's running everything. And I'm sure your agents loved wasn't you it doing this show. It was like, yeah, it was, <laughs> yeah, it was so crazy. No, my agents, I don't know if they understood it. I think they didn't. I, I, I was like, so, you know, for my comedy reel, put the Lady Dynamite stuff. And they were like, it's oh, very funny. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> like, no, people find it funny. You guys have to watch it. It's on people Netflix. People find it funny. It's, no, it's, trust me, yeah, well, we for the people who care. Yeah, well, we just want you to be like, uh, you know, like, like multicam. You know, like, like I have your traditional told, sitcom. I have been told I am mm. not multicam. Mm. Like I get that note. Like you, oh, you're more single cam. Yeah. <laughs> no, I yeah. can see that. Yeah. And you know, but I do tend towards the sort of uh, crazy extreme. Like um, I don't know if you guys have been watching Modern Family yes. um, this season, but I've done a couple of guest spots. I did three actually. The next one comes on May 9th. and in that I'm doing. <laughs> A sort of takeoff of, of someone who's very loosely based on a very famous actress who has a very successful online um, Gwyneth. lifestyle. Well, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but, but it's not her. It's, it's, it's just. It's not her, but it's, a, it's an absurdist version well, well, of. Well, my character is like Nicole Rosemary Page, and I've got like a, a NERP website instead of Called a Goop. NERP. And I only, only realized that Goop actually is the initials G, P at the ends, you know, mm -hmm. so NERP is N, P, Nicole. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> but we sell all kinds of medically adjacent products and, yes. you know, uh, just things, you know, magical stickers. Non-traditional treatments. Yeah, and, you know, yoni eggs and things like that. And, uh, but, but, but she's much, she's, the only thing she really has in common with her is a slight nasality and the fact that she runs this, this empire. Yes. Besides that, she's completely unhinged. I mean, my character is completely, like, she's just, on Chinese herbal Xanax. You know, she's <laughs> taking some kind of plant. Like there's there's a new Chinese plant that's supposed to be stronger than heroin or something. And I think she's taking that like every few hours. And she's really lost and she's like a child who who's paranoid and everything. So it's not it's not Gwyneth. It is not Gwyneth. It's not Gwyneth. <laughs> For the record. So we have some great audience questions. Wanna make okay. sure we get to these. So the first one's from Christine. Where's Christine? Yes. Oh, hello. Christine would like to know if there was one thing you did at the beginning of your career or something that happened that you think had the most impact on your success, and what was it? Or it could be a handful of things as well. Uh, I think going to Win Handman's acting class actually changed my career entirely. Because up until I went to his class, because I'd studied with Bill and then I'd studied with my dad, I was good at being truthful. But I was not really good at creating a character that was different from my outward personality. Mm -hmm. So you see, my actual personality is not necessarily like most of the characters I've played. Mm -hmm. There have been only a few times that I've played somebody who really seems like me on camera. I don't know if I've ever really played the full me on camera. Um, <clears throat> and, but I used to only be able to play sort of straight straight man characters, like the, the straight man in a comedy, like the just the sort of normal person and going to win, I started working on characters really um, and pieces of of dramaturgical, you know, stuff that was really different from me, even though the core had me in it. Like mm -hmm. I feel like I feel like I'm I'm like a piano inside myself, and I play different keys for different parts. It's all mm -hmm. in me. It's all in all of us, right? I mean, the whole human experience and the range of humanity is within all of us. Any of us could be a killer. Any of us could be, you know, laid out in our life for someone we love. You know, there's that whole range in between that, you know, it's all within us. And so, but I started being, playing, you know, the high black keys or whatever, you know, I, in his class. And doing his class, I would get up in front of, you know, a room, you know, he had a little theater kind of set up. So every class day was like a smaller version of this room, but people on risers. And people would, like John Leguizamo was in my class and he would come in and workshop his writing. Like he wow. was workshopping Spicarama while I was there. <laughs> um, and you had this great audience feedback. You were working in front of, you know, your peers. And then Wynn was like the most wonderful, lovely, still is the most incredibly loving father figure to all of us and really encouraged us. And he had this thing called the character interview where you would walk on stage when you were working on a piece, you've been working on a play for a while, and now this is the stage in the process where you'd come on in character. And he would be like, hello, what's your name? Sit down. And he would ask you questions and you would answer in character. And you really had to have done your homework to create this person because you needed to be able to answer everything from an organic place. So you had to have worked on their entire backstory, but you also had to 
be them. You know, you have to really embody that full personality and all those mannerisms and all that kind of internal thing that makes them them. And, um, and that really changed my work. I think it really allowed me to become these people as bizarre as they are. And when I worked on Born Yesterday, that was the precursor to being able to play Linda Ash in My Aphrodite, mm -hmm. or even Romy, or Marilyn. Mm -hmm. Because to play one of these sort of dumb blonde characters, and I was, you know, at that point had very dark hair and was very <laughs> studious and kind of quiet. Like I, I was very um, afraid to speak much in public. I, I mean, I, I would arguably argue strongly in college for like my points about, you know, what we were studying. But I was kind of reticent socially. I was not like an outgoing person. Um, but being able to kind of break out of my shell with these characters was due to that love and encouragement from him and by his method, by, his, by doing this deep character work that was really improvisational and freeing. And to this day, I feel like I really do my best work as a comedic actress in improv. Absolutely. But a lot of my dramatic work too, a lot of the best moments in, in films that have like a breakthrough moment, they've been improv in the moment, they've been ad-libbed a little bit. And I always check with my directors to see if they're cool with that. And some aren't. Some don't want it. They want you to be by the book, by the page. And I respect that. You know, it's, there's different ways of working. But when they're like, and yeah, yeah, go ahead, you know, feel kind of loosey-goosey with it, then I can really find stuff that occurs while we're shooting that take that happens to me and it just kind of comes through me. And that really makes it come alive and make it like real and organic. Hmm. That's great. And on that subject, Victor, our friend in the front row, he would Hi. like to know who is your favorite director that you've worked with or the best experience you've had on a set? Uh, gosh. I did love working with Spike. I really felt like he brought out so much truthfulness in us. And I love that improv, you know, stuff in the beginning. Um, recently I did a film with Nancy Savoca mm. um, and she's Great. a wonderful, wonderful director. We did a movie called Union Square, which is a little gem, <laughs> which I suggest you check out because it's a delight. Um, it's kind of a dramedy and uh, it's a story of two sisters who have this kind of reunion. I come to my sister's door with a secret that I need to tell her and I just don't get around to it for a while and we have all this hilarity ensuing. Um, <laughs> but I'm sort of the bipolar, crazy, loudmouth Bronx sister and she has managed to subsume her Bronx Italianness and pretend she's from Maine and be very <laughs> yoga granola, you know, like zen. And I'm like, like a little hurricane that comes into her life but it turns out that I'm sort of more honest than she is even though I'm embarrassing. Hmm. Um, but it's a wonderful, beautiful, heartfelt movie and the great Patti LuPone plays our mother and oh, it's, wow. it's, it's, it's a terrific movie. So I loved working with her and that was also very improvisational. Hmm. Um, but uh, I loved working with Robert Redford even though it was only on a couple of scenes in Quiz hmm. Show which was one of my earliest oh, wow. movies. Um, hmm. That was great. Uh, there have really been so many wonderful people throughout my career. Um, and I know now he's, he's in hot water because of the last Tango in Paris stuff. And, you know, I deservedly so. But um, Bertolucci worked as a producer on a movie that I worked on in, in Italy um, uh, called The Triumph of Love that his wife, Claire Peplo, directed. And that was a wonderful experience, too. And I really did appreciate his artistry and learning from him. Um, yeah, but there are so many that's almost too many to count, but those are the ones that stick out. You've had some good experiences. Yeah. Um, so this looks like Hailey, is that right? Is that the right name? Oh, <laughs> so to make sure I said it correctly. Um, she would like to know what is the best advice you've received and from whom? Uh, my dad. My dad is always the best advice giver, really. Um, but there was a moment in the... <laughs> when I got cast in Quiz Show by Robert Redford, it was so exciting and so heady. Like, it was huge. It was like my fourth movie, I want to say. And um, I remember going onto the set and the first day and doing take after take after take after take. It was like 12, 15 takes mm -hmm. per angle. And I started getting really nervous because I, I had come from this world of independent film where you didn't have enough film in the can to shoot more than two or, or three money. Kids. I mean, literally, they were shooting short ends on the, you know, you had a can of film and you had like the odds and ends off of other people's rejected film. <laughs> and that's what you were shooting because that's all that you had the money for. And so I, I was like, well, well, I must be not giving him what he wants. And I saw the casting director there and I was like, oh no, 
Oh no, they're going to call up Laura San Giacomo and say we made a mistake, <laughs> and, and 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 come in tomorrow because we need to reshoot these scenes with you, not Mira, and uh, and and I was very, I was very disheartened because like every you know the whole day it was so many takes and I was like I, I must be messing up, I'm failing, and I went home and I was despondent, and I called my dad and I said, Dad, I think I'm going to get fired, and he was like, Well, look, everyone gets fired at some point during their career. Which actually I have not been, but <laughs> <laughs> count yourself. But I've been Very blacklisted, unique. so you know there's that. Um, but uh, um, but uh, you know uh, he said you know so what's the worst that can happen? You could get fired. He said, well, what you need to do is just go in there and give it your best shot. You just go and swing at it really hard. And you take a big artistic leap, make a big strong choice, have the courage of your convictions, and the worst that can happen is you get fired. But if you don't empower yourself and give yourself that license to fail, you will never soar. You will give safe, pleasant performances. But if you don't listen to your own, you know, insides, and go with your conviction and go with your gut and really go for it, make that big, bold artistic choice and go for it, you'll never soar. You'll only be playing it safe your whole life. And you know, the worst that could happen is you get fired and so what? So that, it was a really great piece of advice because it really allowed me to try and get past fear and just do something to the best of my ability, you know, even if it was like a crazy artistic choice. Mm, great advice. And finally, from Scotty, uh, he would like to know, has there been an actor you've worked with who has inspired you to change your style or approach to acting or creating a character? Huh. Well, there, I mean, I've worked with many incredible people. I mean, I worked with Sophia Loren. I worked with Marlon Brando. Uh, you know, I've, I've had people that I idolized my whole life, and there they were right in front of me acting opposite me, and that, that's been a great treat. I can't tell you what it is. What it, immense honor it was to work with them and so many other people like Sir Ben Kingsley, um, so many incredible people. Um, I think Lisa Kudrow influenced me some, mm. you know, because she was such a brilliant comedian and I would just kind of watch her and listen and see how she kind of crafted things to make them just that extra bit of funny. She's great timing. Yeah, and mm -hmm. although we have a different style, like I am just much more coming at from that organic kind of like, you know, Stanislavski <laughs> place. <laughs> um, I felt like we really gelled together and we were friends and we had this love for each other, so that infused everything. But I did mm -hmm. watch her and, and try and learn from her. And, um, and from that point on, I really do watch other comedi comedians and, and, and comics and, and just... I'm I, like I'm in awe though. I'm in awe of I don't know if you've been watching Baskets. Um, <laughs> um, yes. You know uh, what's his name? Zach Louis. Um, oh, uh, Louis, Louis Anderson. Louis Anderson, right? Louis Anderson. What a revelation mm -hmm. as the mom. What a revelation. <laughs> he has such humanity though. He plays it so simply, and he's hilarious because he really reminds me of a lot of older women that I know. <laughs> but it's not a caricature. No, it's not. It's, it's very not. respectful. It's, it's interesting. I, yeah. I love and have so much pathos for that character. Mm, I just, I I, I just, that's just brilliant work. Um, yeah. <laughs> An so. unexpected choice for that part, too. Yeah. yeah. Well, we thank you so much for coming. You were such an inspiration as an actor and an activist. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you.